Good morning, readers. Today is Friday, July 2nd, and you're listening to First Chapter Fridays, presented by the Baker Free Library. My name is Juliana, and I am the library's youth services librarian. Welcome to this week's program. Each Friday throughout the summer, I'll be sharing the first chapter of a book with you that explores, in either a big way or a small way, the animal kingdom. If you like today's chapter, you can place a reserve on the featured book using the library's catalog or by calling the library at 224-7113. While you're listening today, jot down any thoughts, questions, or ideas you have about the story. You can also color or draw, pick up your room, build with Legos, or work on a craft project while you listen. All right, readers, let's jump into today's story. This week, we're headed for the open seas with Lynn Kelly's book, Song for a Whale. From fixing the class computer to repairing old radios, 12-year-old Iris is a tech genius, but she's the only deaf person in her school, so people often treat her like she's not very smart. If you've ever felt like no one was listening to you, then you know how hard that can be. Then she learns about Blue 55, a real whale who was unable to speak to other whales. Iris understands how he must feel. Then she has an idea. She should invent a way to sing to him. But he's 3,000 miles away. How will she play her song for him? Iris is about to go on a grand road trip to make sure the loneliest whale in the ocean is finally heard. Want to hear more of this story? Let's begin reading Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly. Chapter 1 Until last summer, I thought the only thing I had in common with that whale on the beach was a name. I sat with Grandpa after collecting shells and driftwood scattered along the shore and wildflowers from the dunes. The shells and driftwood were for Grandma, and the flowers were for the whale. Grandpa had asked how school was going, and I told him it was the same, which wasn't good. I'd been at that school for two years, and still felt like the new kid. Grandpa patted the sand next to him. Did you know she was probably deaf too? He signed. I didn't have to ask who he meant. The whale had been buried there for 11 years, and my parents had told me enough times about what had happened that day. I shook my head. I hadn't known that, and I didn't know why Grandpa was changing the subject. Maybe he didn't know what to tell me anymore about school. The whale had beached herself the same day I was born. When she was spotted in the shallow waters of the gulf, some people stood on the shore and watched her approach. My grandma ran into the cold February water and tried to push her away from land, as if she could make a 40-ton animal change her mind about where she wanted to go. That was really dangerous. Even though the whale was weak by then, one good whack with a tail or a flipper could have knocked grandma out. I don't know what I would have done, jumped in like she did, or just stood there. She wasn't born deaf like we were, Grandpa continued. The scientist who studied her said it just happened. Maybe she'd been swimming near an explosion from an oil rig or a bomb test. When Grandpa told a story, I saw it as clearly as if it were happening right there in front of me. His signing hands showed me the whale in an ocean that suddenly went quiet, swimming over there, over there, over there, trying to find the sounds again. Maybe that was why she'd been there on the Gulf of Mexico, instead of in deep ocean waters where she belonged. Say whales didn't swim so close to shore. Only her on that day. A whale can't find its way through a world without sound, Grandpa added. The ocean is dark, and it covers most of the earth, and whales live in all of it. The sounds guide them through that, and they talk to one another across the ocean. With the familiar sounds of the ocean gone, the whale was lost in her new silent world. A rescue group came to the beach and tried to save the whale, and they called her Iris. Grandma asked my parents to give the name to me, too, since I'd entered the world as the whale was leaving it. After the marine biologists learned all they could from her, she was buried right there on the beach, along with the unanswered questions about what had brought her to the shore. We lived on that coast until the summer after second grade, when my family moved to Houston for my dad's new job. Since then, we went back just once or twice a summer. The good thing about our new home was that it was closer to my grandparents'. I liked being able to spend more time with them, 
especially since they were both deaf, like me. But we all missed the beach, and I missed being around kids like me. My old school had just a few deaf kids, but that was enough. We had our classes together, and we had one another. But it's different for us, Grandpa signed. Out here, there's more light, and all we need is our own small space to feel at home. Sometimes it takes time to figure things out, but you'll do it. You'll find your way. I wish I'd asked him then how long that would take. Chapter 2 Even though electronics is a sciencey thing, science was the one class where I wasn't reading about it on the sly. Usually I paid attention to what was going on in there because I liked science and my teacher, Sophia Alamia. I even liked the way her name rolled off my hand like a wave when I spelled it out. Ms. Alamia wrote the letters H-Z on the board. Remember what that stands for? she asked. A few hands went up and Miss Alamia called on me. I spelled out Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, and Mr. Charles voiced it for the class. That's right, said Miss Alamia, and what does it measure? The frequency of sound. I wondered why Miss Alamia was reviewing frequencies. We'd taken the test on it months ago. I found something that ties in nicely with what we're studying now, she said, as if she'd heard me. It's about a special whale, and you'll see why frequency is important. Miss Alamia pressed some keys on the computer at her desk, and her eyeglasses reflected the video that played. The projector screen in front of the room showed a big blue square with no signal in one corner. I was heading to Miss Alamia's desk even before she signed, please help, to me. After restarting the video and pausing it, I connected the computer to the projector signal, then clicked CC at the bottom of the screen to turn on the closed captioning. The video started with a whale swimming in the ocean. Because of the captions, I could read the words on the screen instead of from Mr. Charles's hands. The dark gray-blue body of the whale filled up the screen, his tail waving up and down. The narrator in the video talked about a whale called Blue 55, who swam around by himself and not in a pod, like most whales do. As far as anyone knew, it had always been that way. He didn't have any friends or a family to swim with or talk to. He was a kind of baleen whale, the kind that eat plankton and small fish, not the kind with teeth that ate squid and seals. But he was a hybrid. His mother was a blue whale, and his father was a fin whale. The problem, said the narrator, is Blue 55's unique voice. Most whales call out at frequencies of 35 hertz and lower, while this lonely whale sounds are at around 55 hertz. Only about 20 hertz off, but it made a big difference. He was speaking a language that only he knew. Furthermore, his song is in a unique pattern. Even if other whales can hear him, they don't understand what he's saying. Blue 55 likely couldn't communicate with his own parents. My stomach tightened into a ball. I want another whale on the screen to swim up to Blue 55, or at least to look at him. The strange calls of Blue 55 were first detected by sonar in the late 1980s. Marine biologists figured out what was making the sounds and why the whale was all alone in the ocean. I didn't notice until the words on the screen blurred that my eyes were watery. Mr. Charles handed me a tissue from his pocket. Maybe I'd sniffled or something. Allergies, I signed, without looking away from the video. The narrator went on to say that researchers from a marine sanctuary had tried to put a tracker on Blue 55 so they could follow his migration pattern, which was also weird and unlike other whales. They did get a sample of his skin to test. That was how they figured out his parents had been different species. Before they could attach the tracker to him, he dove down and swam away. He wouldn't need to resurface for a breath for another 20 minutes. Without a tracker on him, the only way anyone ever knew where he was swimming was from underwater microphones that picked up his unique song. I didn't remember standing up, but when the video ended and Miss Alamia started talking, I had to look down to see Mr. Charles. Everyone's eyes were on me as I slid back down into my chair. My textbook was on the floor. I must have knocked it off my desk when I stood up. I left it at my feet. Can you imagine that? Miss Alamia asked, swimming around for all those years, unable to communicate with anyone? Yes. She said something else about frequencies, but I wasn't paying attention anymore. I looked through Mr. Charles as if I could still see that whale on the screen. Blue 55 didn't have a pot of friends or a family who spoke his language, but he still sang. He was calling and calling, and no one heard him. And 
that's where we'll stop for today. If you'd like to hear more of this story, call the library or visit bowbakerfreelibrary.org to reserve Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly. To hear the rest of the summer's feature titles, search for First Chapter Fridays on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you'd like to tune in. You can also view the library's entire catalog of episodes, past and present, at anchor.fm slash bfl5. You can also find all of this information on the library's website. Thank you for listening to this episode of First Chapter Fridays. Tune in again next week for another great story.